All right, we got Morgan so far. I think you uh, got to unmute yourself. I was able to unmute myself. You first have to unmute yourself. There's a there's a new technology for this. Oh, there we go. I can see Charles is making it work. Brian's yeah, making you it click work. the video mute button. So next, each right next to the microphone, uh, Bradley. There we go. Okay. Whew. Morgan saves the day once again. Let's call. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, uh, man, May 29, 2015. So today we are going to be talking about uh, problems with the light sail, uh, selection for the Europa mission, um, what's happening on the space station, uh, pretty cool stuff happening for SpaceX, of course, this week in Musk. Uh, we're talking about what's happening with Rosetta and uh, some stuff on the Kuiper Belt and uh, lots of galaxy information. So we got a lot of news to get to today. Uh, joining us this week, we've got Dr. Brian Koberlein. Hi. Nice to see you. How's it going? We've got Charles Black from Send.com. Hey, Charles. Hey. Good afternoon, evening, morning. <laughs> You're living in the future, so you tell us, do we get jetpacks in the future? Uh, we got Morgan Renberg, hey, doctorate Frazier. in training. And we've got a very special guest this week, and I am super excited to welcome uh, Dr. Bradley, Bradley Peterson, who is uh, the professor and department chair at the Department of Astronomy at Ohio State University. And uh, Dr. Peterson works on uh, active galactic nuclei, galaxies, uh, but he is also on the, uh, the NASA Science Committee, and so he's going to join us and talk both about galaxies and what's going on with NASA and science. So, Dr. Peterson, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? I'm... Uh... Yep, we can hear you just fine. Great. Okay. Um, just don't, yeah, don't glad press to be here. Mute button. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll take a we'll take a few minutes as usual. We'll talk to uh, our special guest, and then we'll get on to the space news. But I just want to remind everybody that this is a live interactive show. You can talk to us. We will be able to answer. Uh, and the way to do that <clears throat> is to use the Q and A app, which is a cool application. Wherever you're watching this video right now, it'll say that we're interacting with the audience. Click that. You get a new view of the screen. You can still watch the video, but then you'll see all of the questions. And just to demonstrate, I always have, it's always scary when I say this, we've got a bunch of people watching right now. So I'm going to say hi to Lionel Ward and Hugo Burnham and Tony Lynch and Sylvan Westby and uh, Elad Avron and Richard Clark and Guido Bibra and Nancy Graziano and Tom Nathie and, and Jason Carlson and Stephen Hawkins, David Dunn, it just goes on. Richard Strassel and uh, Matt Woods. Oh, and congratulations, Matt. We uh, we know what happened. Awesome. Um, we'll get into that later. Uh, Graham Ash, Linda Sedek, uh, William Hutchins. Wow, this is great. Big crowd. So uh, go ahead and post a question for the guest, for you know any comments you want to make about any of these the uh, stories that we're going to be covering today, and we'll we'll get at them. So we got a lot of news. We have got a great guest. So let's get let's get cracking. So. Dr. Peterson, welcome so much. Uh, so first, before uh, we get into the NASA stuff, let's talk a bit about your history as, uh, I guess, as a as a researching astronomer. What what do you specialize in? Uh, I work on uh, the inner structure of uh, quasars, and quasars are uh, supermassive black holes at the center of most massive galaxies, and they're actively accreting mass. And as they accrete mass, uh, the uh, they form accretion disks around the black hole, and the accretion disk is very hot, very luminous, so we can see these things at vast distances, and we use them as tracers of the history of the universe. And I know sort of in the most, I mean, back in the day, right, people didn't really know what these quasars were. They were little, you know, they were potentially some kind of communication from alien civilizations, or maybe, you know, that they were, you know, but they were this point-like object that was, you know, potentially billions of, of light years away, and and it's turned out, of course, that now we really understand them as these, you know, the center of the actively feeding centers of 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 galaxies. You know, were, when did that sort of change from we have no idea what these are to we kind of know what they are to we're really pretty sure what this is now? When did that sort of transformation happen? I'd I'd say that that for almost everyone that transition took place in. Uh, between about 1978 and 1980. Uh, there were holdouts uh, until 
and until probably 15 years ago, uh, insisting that they were some other sort of phenomenon. But what happened in the late 70s and early 80s was uh, actually it was the advent of CCD detectors made low light level detection possible. <clears throat> Two things happened. First, uh, Alan Stockton at the University of Hawaii uh, looked at a bunch of relatively low redshift nearby quasars and he found an excess number of galaxies in the immediate vicinity of the quasar and they had the same redshift as a quasar. Now that pretty much nailed it for most of us. But then the other thing that happened was in uh, 1980, in one of the first app astronomical applications of a CCD detector, uh, Todd Borison and Bev Oak uh, imaged the fuzzy light around the point-like quasar and discovered that it was starlight and starlight at the same redshift as the quasar. So at that point, almost everyone accepted the fact that, yes, quasars are embedded in galaxies. But just, you know, the, the bright objects, the bright objects in the visual spectrum, the quasars, there was a whole range of objects that were sort of in the same mysterious category, right? There's ones that were giving off a lot of radio waves, mm -hmm. ones that were giving off, you know, other kinds of, of light curves. And I know that sort of astronomers started to realize that it was the same object just in the way it was facing towards and away from us. Yes, orientation, uh, it took a long time to figure out how important orientation was and why it was important. And uh, it's, it's basically because uh, the equatorial plane of a quasar has a, um, uh, a torus surrounding it that's made up of gas and more importantly dust, and the dust is opaque. So when you look at a quasar edge on, you actually can't see right down to the point like source. You can basically only see it in reflection. It looks quite a bit different. Uh, or you can only see the parts that are very extended. But when you move it towards edge on, it takes on an entirely different appearance. And then there are some that are bright in the radio and others that are rather faint in the radio. And the reason it took a long time to make a connection among these different types is that the first quasars that were found were very extreme examples of quasars. Very different, it, it turns out, than relatively nearby Seifert galaxies, which you can look at and say, oh yeah, that's a normal galaxy, except it's got an abnormally bright, very central core. Uh, and it was actually uh, only when we found objects that bridged the gap between them, essentially the missing link between the two, that we began to understand that these are this, basically the same phenomena. It's just that there's a very wide range of masses that go from a million or less solar masses uh, for the central black holes in these Seifert type galaxies, which are very common we find nearby, to the uh, billion solar mass black holes that are relatively rare and that we see generally only, only at fairly large distances. But the current thinking now is just that these supermassive black holes are there everywhere, right? Every galaxy has one, and That's it's just right, whether yeah. they're feeding or not. That's right, and what we see when we look at ga galaxies which are not active, uh, we find that they have massive black holes at their centers, which are essentially dead quasars. They were active at one time, but they are no longer accreting mass. And the first person that figured this out was actually Donald Lindenbell, and he pretty, he pretty much had this right back in 1969. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So here's my favorite question to ask people on this thing, which is, which came first? The, uh, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy or the galaxy that surrounds it? That's a very interesting question, and I think that uh, that's one that very quickly did degenerates into a religious war. Uh, people, <laughs> right. people, yeah, people believe various things, and I, I'm, in this religious war, I'm agnostic. So I'm, uh, I'm, I have an open mind on this and trying to figure out how, how this happens. But wh the evidence seems to be quite good that they co-evolve, because there is a very tight correlation between the uh, mass of the central black hole and the, the mass, at least, of the... Uh, uh, of the bulge of the galaxy, and there's no clear cause and effect because the black hole is a small, small percentage of that total mass. And so, do you think that the Milky Way had a, a quasar in the past? Oh yes, yeah, probably not a very bright one, but uh, uh, it certainly has a, a black hole that would qualify as a, 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 a local Seifert galaxy. Um, we wouldn't have seen it though. It was, uh, you know, there's in the optical. There's something like 30 magnitudes of extinction between us and the galactic center. So uh, uh, we can only see what's going on in the galactic center when we look at the infrared, where the dust is transparent. Yeah, it's interesting to think about that. That even though we're very close 
to the center of our galaxy, the amount of distance just spreads out the light that, that it wouldn't be particularly bright. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would just be you know, too much dust in the way. And maybe a chance in the future when we collide with Andromeda, we may get a shot at uh, getting a quasar again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I haven't really thought too much about it. Uh, there are, it is thought that uh, one way to trigger quasars is through uh, through interactions, through collisions. But uh, it's yeah, when Andromeda and uh, the Milky Way collide, it's going to be it's it's going to be interesting, but not quite as active as people might think. I mean, if you actually work out what's the probability of stars hitting each other. Uh, the number of stellar collisions that you could expect by merging Andromeda and the Milky Way is approximately one. Right. One collision, yes. One collision, yeah. yeah. It's just a swarm of bees passing. That's right. Yeah, the stars are very, very small compared to the distances between them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is sort of you know the really the cutting edge then of of this work? You know, like right now, what are the what are the big unanswered questions that people are working on? Well, I think you put your finger on it earlier when you asked me which came first, uh, the black hole or the galaxy. I mean, this, this is what we're trying to understand is how galaxies evolve. Um, uh, I, I'm still trying to understand the details of the accretion process, uh, exactly how the fueling works and how the gas in the immediate vicinity of the black hole is, uh, uh, how it gets down there. So uh, there are very detailed questions like that, and then there are very broad brush questions and and hopefully the uh, solutions to one will you know help illuminate the solution to the other how close have have astronomers gotten to being able to resolve the accretion disk around the the supermassive black hole you know what's the state of the art in observations right now well we we still can't resolve the accretion disks because they're very very small so the the kind of work that I'm engaged in uh, it, we just try to we, we just say okay well that's hopeless we're not going to try to resolve it angularly but what we can do is we can look at the time variability and we can substitute time resolution for angular resolution so if we look at things very frequently and look at how they're changing we can actually trace out what the inner structures are and we can get down to sizes of that project to micro arc seconds, so far better than we can do with the imaging. But perhaps uh, you know some new instruments, some super space telescopes in the future might might get the resolution a little better. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. It's, yeah. It's uh, it's it's very possible that we'll be able to do this uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and you know, but right now, what we're doing is uh, uh, the best we can do with what we have. Yeah. Uh, so well, let's talk a bit about your work then with the NASA Science Advisory Committee. So, so what if, for people who aren't aware of this of this group, so what is your role? Well, the uh, NASA advisory structure uh, is really quite complicated. Uh, it uh, there are advisory committees that uh, correspond to every level of bureaucracy in the scientific hierarchy in NASA. So the highest level committee is the. Uh, uh, the NASA Advisory Council, and I'm a member of that, and we advise the administrator on uh, uh, on various topics. And uh, the council has a number of committees. One of them is a science committee, and I'm the chair of the science committee, and we provide advice to the uh, uh, associate administrator uh, for the science mission director at uh, John Grunsfeld. Uh, and then below that, there is an astrophysics subcommittee that... Uh, advises the astrophysics division, uh, etc. And below that there are program analysis groups. So there's a, it's really quite a, uh, a complicated structure. It involves a lot of people on the outside uh, giving NASA lots of advice. Uh, so at the science committee level we're, uh, uh, you know, we're dealing with um, issues like uh, priorities in, um, uh, for example, we're looking at the uh, uh, this uh, the uh, asteroid redirect mission, for example, is something that we discuss. Uh, where uh, they've now settled on a strategy of of uh, flying to an asteroid, uh, landing on it, picking up a four meter size boulder, dragging it back to lunar orbit, where it can be investigated. And a lot of the technology, for example, that will be needed for that is technology that will be needed to go to Mars. And uh, of course, Mars is uh, the ultimate destination, uh, but there are a lot of technical problems, uh, including human survivability, uh, that have to be solved before we uh, attempt to go there.
Yeah, I mean, a lot of those are, are you can just imagine, I mean, n not only the sort of the long duration space flight interacting with an object, I mean, we saw with Rosetta how difficult it was to even land a spacecraft, a robotic spacecraft on a very low gravity object. You just can imagine mm -hmm. how difficult it would be to land, find a boulder, retrieve it off the surface, and bring it back to, yeah. to lunar orbit. That's a exactly. I mean, level of difficulty. It? Rosetta landed very gently, but it nevertheless managed to bounce for hundreds of meters before it finally settled down. So, yeah, actually settling into a particular spot is, is hard. Now, if I understand correctly, you go through sort of a 10-year cycle, don't you, with the sort of decadal, sort of like fairly long range where, the, where all the scientists kind of come together and they let their, their long, you know, I guess their wish list, their priorities yes. known, and then those turn into sort of priorities and mission concepts. So I'd love to know sort of a bit more about, about that process. Yeah, the process is initiated basically by the National Research Council and uh, once every 10 years we get together and we draw up our priorities for uh, what, what we want to see on sort of the, uh, a 10-year horizon. Um, some of these things, when we talk about um, what we think of as flagship missions, we often have to identify those about 20 years in advance. So, you know, if you go back to, uh, uh, you know, the 1970s, you'll find uh, that's where there is endorsement of the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. When you get into the 90s, uh, it was an endorsement of the, well, it, okay, 2000 was the James Webb Space Telescope. But, uh, yeah, it just takes a long time for these things to develop because they're billion dollar class missions and they, um, uh, you know, they employ technologies uh, that in some cases haven't even been invented yet. I mean, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope, we made mirrors out of beryllium. That's, you know, that's great, but beryllium's poisonous. <laughs> and so it has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion, so you can get it down close to absolute zero and the mirror retains its shape. So, uh, you know, working through things like that can take more than a decade. Um, can I can I put in a request? Sure. Uh, so I would like you to, to bring back the terrestrial planet finder, if that would be possible. There's because I think, you know, if we can analyze the atmospheres of extrasolar planets for uh, oxygen or perhaps pollution, we could answer once and for all if there's other life in the universe. So yeah, I, I think the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to do some of this. But, of course, my pet project would be a giant UV optical telescope in space, something much bigger that's ever been built before. What I would like to see is us commit to building such a telescope on orbit and maybe using the space station as a base to have astronauts assemble it. Because you can't bring something much larger than uh, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, up as a single unit. It's just... The, the, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like a good mixture between, like, like here on Earth, right, the advantage of the great big observatories is that you can go out and replace the camera array, or if there's a problem, you can go out and, you know, bang on it gently with a hammer and, and get the mechanism working again. But mm -hmm. as we've seen, so many great spacecraft, so many great observatories have failed because of, you know, say it with me, gyros. Uh, breaking down. So to be able to have a nice store of gyros right there on the space station that you can pop another one out and just walk over and, and put it back into the observatory, I think that would be a great uh, a great platform for the for the space station. I think that sounds well, great. That was, that was one of the great successes of Hubble is when uh, it, uh, they, out of necessity, figured out that they could service it on orbit. You know, the original intention with Hubble was to actually retrieve it from or orbit bring it back down to Earth to service it, and then send it back up. And uh, sort of post-Challenger, people realized how incredibly dangerous that was. And uh, um, it, it was in that interval, in that uh, w during the stand-down, uh, the shuttle fleet between 1986 and 1990, uh, two people in particular, Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan, spent a lot of time developing tools that astronauts could use to service Hubble on, on orbit. Uh, those are two names that uh, don't get enough credit for what they did, but they they basically built the groundwork for uh, an observatory that was going to last for a long time. Um, so I'm seeing from some people here uh, <clears throat> that they're only seeing me and Morgan. Is this still the case? Because I'm we're seeing everybody here in our list. But if you're still seeing this, please let me know. Um, I'll try turning Brian and let's see. I'll try turning me off on and off again. Yeah. 
So, Brian, can you try turning yourself back on again? And same, Bradley, can you try unmuting your video? I'm not sure if it's still... Okay, I think I turned my camera back on. Yeah, okay, well, we'll see. It's, right. I'm going to assume it's, it's working now, and, and this was back, in, back before. Uh, also, I hate technology. So, uh, so go ahead, uh, people watching, if you have any questions... Uh, for Dr. Peterson, this is this is your opportunity. Again, if you want to make requests, he's he's clearly taking them right now. Uh, so, uh, cool. Well, let's let's move on to the to the news, and I, I'm sure a bunch of these are going to be in your wheelhouse. So I know you've got some you'll have some some opinions uh, in perhaps not an official NASA advisory capacity, but purely as a uh, astronomy uh, geek like the rest of us. So, mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, let's move on to let's talk about the light sail, Morgan. Yeah, last week we talked about how uh, the Planetary Society's experimental solar sail, the light sail, had launched um, aboard an Atlas V along with uh, the Air Force's space plane and was going to be uh, executing a series of test maneuvers, etc., over the coming weeks uh, in preparation for a full uh, test launch next year with, with a spacecraft that will be maneuvered by the solar sail. Uh, and we found out this week why they were con uh, conducting this test launch to begin with, because the spacecraft has basically stopped working. Uh, and it turns out that they believe that the problem is a software glitch. Uh, and so these little CubeSats, uh, unlike a lot of NASA um, satellites, which are uh, have custom software written for them um, that's basically bulletproof, uh, these, a lot of these CubeSats run on Linux. Uh, and one particular routine that a lot of these CubeSats use to basically sort of store data before transmitting it back to the Earth had an error that had been discovered in it where if you stored too much data, the system uh, basically froze. Uh, and you could solve this, the uh, designers hopefully noted, by restarting uh, the computer on board the CubeSat. But as Bill Nye sort of wryly pointed out this week, uh, there's no one up there to press the reset button. Um, and so their system is basically stuck in a frozen state right now where it isn't accepting commands from, uh, from the ground. And so the Planetary Society has a patch to basically update the software, fix this problem, and restore communications, but they can't get the CubeSat to acknowledge the transmission. And so, and so it's not carrying out that update. Uh, and with no one there to restart... Um, the computer, they're kind of at an impasse. But fortunately, these CubeSats have another problem um, that may actually, in this case, save them. And that's that they're relatively susceptible to uh, radiation, and occasionally a bit of radiation will strike something important on the computer chip that runs these things, and it'll cause it to restart. Uh, just basically accidentally causes a, a fault in the system, and the computer uh, has to restart automatically to recover from that fault. Uh, and that sort of protection is uh, is built in. And on average, these CubeSats restart every sort of four to eight weeks uh, based on a random strike from a cosmic ray or some other little bit of radiation out there in space. Uh, and so this is going to be the saving grace, uh, they hope, that sometime, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, the computer will encounter a malfunction uh, because of a, a cosmic ray hit, will restart, and will then be able to listen again for commands uh, that allow them to patch it. This sounds there, similar to what happened with the uh, with Spirit and Opportunity, where they were you know, counting on dust devils to bring back their level of electrical function, right? Yeah, it, it's it is similar that you need this sort of fortuitous intervention of nature to to save us from uh, either our own design choices or our own uh, faults. Uh, now, unlike maybe Spirit and Opportunity, which had a bit of a longer chance to survive, there's not a lot of opportunity here for this to happen. Because the primary mission of this CubeSat was only supposed to be about five or six weeks. And without any rocket engines on it, they can't boost it up to keep it in orbit. Uh, it just is slowly decaying due to drag from the atmosphere. And so they hope that they'll be able to get this fortuitous restart, upload the, the patched code, and deploy the solar sail before anything um, goes too far into the atmosphere that it stops working. Um, so unfortunately, the mission's not going uh, as planned, but fortunately this was specifically designed to find out problems like this. Uh, and in that capacity, it's working exactly as intended. 
<laughs> so this is a good example where it would be sure great to have a reset button, you know, have an astronaut, have it, you know, very close to a space station where an astronaut could reach out and you know press the, the reset button, or maybe some kind of robotic reset button that would just be attached to the outside of the spacecraft and maybe controlled by a different group. You know, yeah, some, some. I mean, so the spacecraft that go say to other planets that costs you know more than a million dollars or so that it, it costs to build a CubeSat have incredible amount of protection built in. Uh, not just in sense of shielding them from radiation, but also in being able to self-diagnose and self-save from these sorts of problems. Uh, and so, a, for example, a, a good sort of software feature that a lot of these programs have is if the computer detects that it's stuck, it hasn't received signal for longer than it should have, they just automatically restart themselves. Um, and a lot of computers uh, that go into interplanetary missions have uh, two sides, and they only use one side of the computer for normal operation. But if they detect, wait, something isn't right, they just automatically restart and flip to the other computer uh, and go into some sort of you know, save me mode where they just point all the antennas back at Earth and wait for them to say something. Uh, and so these kinds of protections are built into bigger missions, but something cheap like a CubeSat is basically meant to be expendable. And so this is really not uh, a terribly unexpected outcome for a satellite like this. That is, that is still pretty rough, right? Because this is their second problem, if I recall. The first one crashed with the with a launch failure. A right, they tried ago. about a decade ago. Yeah. And they lost their first satellite uh, in a launch failure. And so that yeah. was nothing to do with them, but the launch vehicle failed uh, to make it to orbit. It turns out space is, is tough. That's what they tell me. Yeah. Uh, and you've made a career in it. Now's your chance. All right, uh, Charles, let's talk about the, uh, the new, uh, I guess, what's going to happen with the space station. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay, uh, but I would be interested to see from the viewers. I know the viewers are having trouble seeing some of the people on the video mm -hmm. stream, and I know it's my fault because everything is my fault, but I, I am out of options. So I have unmuted and muted, remuted the, everyone's video. We can all see each other. I apologize. We all are very handsome gentlemen here, but, um, but for some reason some of you are not able to see some of you. On, who are actually watching the show? I apologize, um, and uh, we'll let me know if it changes. Uh, so, uh, but we but we can hear you, and I know people can okay. hear you. They might just be able to see you. Go ahead, okay. Charles. Okay. So the the background to uh, this is lots going on with commercial space. Um, this week, the space station used its robotic arm, uh, the Canadran two, uh, to move the Leonardo um, PMM module. Uh, and the idea is to make way for two new uh, parking bays uh, for the SpaceX Crew Dragon and the Boeing CST-100 vehicles that will be delivering astronauts to the space station from 2017 onwards. Um, it, it's part of an ongoing project that started earlier this year with a number of spacewalks and there are some spacewalks scheduled for uh, later this year as well. Uh, to install the uh, adapters that the spacecraft will um, latch onto when they arrive there and they're going to be fitted uh, later this year when they're taken up to the space station on board a uh, cargo version of Dragon. So the space station has been uh, is gradually getting itself ready for these new uh, commercial crew carriers. Uh, other news on this this week was NASA announced that they've given their the first contract for a, uh, a commercial space taxi service to Boeing. Um, it's all still subject to Boeing completing the development of their CST-100 capsule and they still have to obviously be uh, certified uh, and they've got test flights planned and so forth. But the plan is that they will start uh, ferrying astronauts, um, both uh, cosmonauts and astronauts from 2017. Uh, SpaceX say NASA will get a similar contract uh, later this year and they still haven't actually decided who's going to fly first whether it's going to be the Boeing CST-100 or the crew version of the the Dragon capsule um, but I think it's uh, exciting times to see those uh, spacecraft coming together they've been working on them for several years uh, and um, since the retirement of the Space Shuttle in July 2011, 
obviously the only way to get to and from the space station is on board the Russian Soyuz. Uh, and there has been some sort of concerns uh, recently over that, um, particularly after the, the failure of the Progress cargo ship, the M27M, which failed to reach the right orbit and gradually uh, fell back to Earth. And that was launched by a Soyuz rocket, a slightly different variation from the one that launches the Soyuz crew capsule, but nonetheless a... Uh, enough of a concern to have, have grounded the Soyuz rockets temporarily. So I think there's uh, a general sense that the sooner there is a uh, redundancy, really, in terms of choice for getting people to and from the space station, the better. So yeah. good, good news this week. Yeah, well, and there's been a bunch of, so I know you didn't put these in the docket, but kind of very related to this is that SpaceX has been uh, certified by the U.S. Air Force to yeah. start launching some of their payloads, and as well as been certified by NASA to start launching some of their larger, sort of, the larger space missions as well. So, yeah. so there's sort of quite a big shuffling and reshuffling that's going on now in all of the, you know, in this case, Boeing is getting some access to the space station, yeah. but SpaceX is potentially going to be taking some of their, uh, some of their launches. Um, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Peterson, how do you sort of feel about uh, sort of the rise of, of SpaceX now in sort of providing a new source of launch opportunities? Does the does the lowering of, of the cost start to play into some of the missions that maybe you that you can start suggesting and recommending? Well, uh, we hope so. Uh, I I must admit that I'm I'm pleasantly surprised at the success that uh, commercial space has had. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that it was possible. And it was, you know, just from uh, drawing analogies with what happened uh, uh, with privatization of uh, uh, airlines back in the late 40s and early 50s, where it was possible because you had this ready supply of uh, aircraft left over from the war and trained pilots and it wasn't too hard to put everything together. But now when you're looking at commercialization of space vehicles, you know, which there's a tremendous risk that a, co a company incurs in, uh, uh, in designing and testing uh, uh, transportation systems uh, and uh, then the question is going to be, are they, you know, can, can, they, can they hope to um, make the money back? So uh, um, I wouldn't have predicted, even five years ago, the level of success that they've had so far, and I'm delighted to see it. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, and obviously you've got just SpaceX uh, and Boeing at the moment on the commercial crew, but there are other companies developing orbital spacecraft like Blue Origin. Uh, so they, you know, when it comes to the next round of contracts, and potentially they might be bidding, um, and similar to the cargo transportation that SpaceX has successfully done with Dragon and uh, Orbital ATK, as it now is, with, with its Cygnus cargo ship. Uh, there's a second round. At the moment, the uh, supply contracts have been extended to cover the period to the end of 2017. And then NASA said that in September, it was originally June, but it's moved to September, they're going to award new cargo supply resupply contracts or CRS, Commercial Resupply Services contracts, um, for the period 2018 to 2024, which is when they expect the space station's uh, life to come to an end. And there's lots more commercial companies going to be bidding for those, like Lockheed Martin, Sierra Nevada Corporation are doing a sort of cargo version of their Dream Chaser, which was originally built to be a, uh, a cruise ship. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and Boeing as well are, are going to be bidding for that, as well yeah. as SpaceX. So. It's, um, you know, the commercial space industry is really taking shape and, and really at quite a, a rapid pace. Yeah, absolutely. So I just had Brian uh, reload his browser, and so now the question is, can you all see him now? So, and I'm going to ask him to talk about, uh, speaking of uh, uh, galactic black holes, uh, Brian, you've got a story about uh, bright galaxies. Uh, oh, there you go. Yes. Um, <laughs> Calm me yeah, park. I technology, I, here I am asking you questions about space. Bright Ask galaxies hint at the fast yeah, growth of galactic black holes. Yes, this is this was actually a discovery of, uh, I think it's called extremely luminous or ultra-luminous uh, infrared galaxies. 
So they've recently discovered what is thus far the brightest infrared galaxy ever discovered. And uh, to give you an idea of how much energy this thing is putting off, it is it has a luminosity equivalent to about uh, 350 trillion suns, and it's smaller than our galaxy. So, so this is incredibly bright, and, and it's very bright in the infrared. And so the idea is that this is being powered indirectly by uh, a very active black hole, the idea being that you know, as the, as the black hole is producing all of this energy in x-rays and ultraviolet and all of that, it is shrouded in this, you know, region of dust that absorbs all of that light and then emits in the infrared. And so the way it's getting this infrared luminosity is, is through that indirect method. The thing is that this particular galaxy is so bright that the central black hole would have to be incredibly active. In fact, more active than you would typically expect. And so it, it seems to be an indicator of very rapid growth of a black hole, a black hole that's you know, consuming a lot of matter very quickly in order to produce these very bright uh, infrared emanations. So, Dr. Peterson, this is right, uh, right up your alley here. What, uh, you know, would you have predicted this? Oh, this is one of those things, the most extreme phenomena you never really predict. You kind of stumble upon them. Uh, but, yeah, this, uh, this is a, a matter of we recognize the type of behavior. Uh, it's just more extreme than we have seen before. It's, uh, you know, that's it's almost, uh, uh, I'll, I'd, I'm going to say ballpark, at least ten times as luminous as uh, uh, previously known uh, ultra-luminous galaxies. So this one's uh, very spectacular. And uh, it, uh, we think that a lot of galaxies sort of start out this way, and we think that uh, they, um, they essentially shut down star formation in their own galaxies by being so bright, because all that gas and dust that's sur uh, surrounding them is going to heat it all up. And it won't, once it's hot, you can't form it into stars anymore. So we it, think this is often how galaxies just shut down star formation. Right, it's sort of a similar analogy to how just like even a solar nebula will, when you've got a big star forming nebula and you've got these super hot stars that are blasting out with the radiation, they clear out all that gas and dust, and then all everything else has to starve. And so, but okay. that on a galactic scale just sounds amazing. Right, yeah. So it looks like I think we, I think we've solved the problem. So so, uh, Dr. Peterson, all I need you to do is hit Control R on your keyboard, mm -hmm. and then bring yourself back into the Hangout, and that should allow people to see your video and. And so you'll drop out yeah. for a second. Okay. Uh, and then while you're doing that, let's move on back to uh, to Morgan, and we'll get a get another story from from Morgan's list. So uh, Morgan, th this is this is big news this week, right? Let's talk about the uh, the Europa uh, mission science selection. In um in some planetary circles, this is the biggest news that uh, has come out in years, uh, and that was uh, NASA's uh, ultimate selection of what instruments will be riding along the Europa Clipper uh, spacecraft uh, when it visits um, Jupiter's moon Europa sometime in the late 2020s or the early 2030s. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Europa is one of the four large moons of Jupiter. We call them the Galilean moons. And it's of particular interest to us because we think that underneath its icy surface is an ocean of liquid water that holds uh, more water than all of the oceans and lakes and rivers uh, on planet Earth combined. And so such an enormous source of water has certainly spawned the notion that this could be a place where life arises uh, or has in the past arisen and therefore is a place that we like to go and check out. Uh, and so the instruments that were selected to travel to um, Europa are very focused on understanding and analyzing that uh, undersea ocean. And so from 33 proposals, um, NASA selected nine instruments uh, to make the final journey to Jupiter. Uh, and you can group them basically into three categories. Uh, the first category is what we would call the in situ instruments, or instruments that measure the environment right around the spacecraft. Uh, and the first two that they included, uh, a plasma detector and what's called a magnetometer, um, are vital for understanding the size of the ocean. 
Because the only way we know the ocean exists in the first place is by measuring the magnetic field that it creates. Um, the ocean is extremely salty, and salt water, as you probably know, uh, kind of acts like a conductor. And, and so when you have a big ocean of conducting water, it's kind of like a giant coil of wire. And when you move a coil of wire through a magnetic field, it ultimately ends up creating a magnetic field of its own. And by measuring that magnetic field and understanding the physics of how that works, we could actually determine sort of the size and in some ways the composition of the ocean uh, just by making a measurement far away from the planet, or in this case, the moon. The other two in situ instruments uh, are a dust detector, which will measure the dust environment around um, around the moon, as well as maybe measure the composition of some of the materials that could be coming out of any plume, uh, and a mass spectrometer, which tells you the exact molecular composition of uh, that dusty material. Now, I'm still yeah, I'm still ahead. not hearing a drill. They'll go yeah, no uh, drill. 20 kilometers, 100 kilometers through so, solid ice. But we'll I, I'm sure that's coming, so, so please continue. Yeah, so the second set of instruments we have are what we call our remote sensing instruments. Uh, and chief among these, of course, is a camera. There'll actually be two visible light cameras, a wide-angle color camera and a narrow-angle black-and-white camera. And these will map parts of the surface of Europa uh, up to the scale of 50 centimeters per pixel and they'll map the entire surface of Europa at a scale uh, no worse than 50 meters per pixel. Um, they'll also include a thermal camera on board, and this will be to look for heat, local heat spots on the surface of Europa, much like we see uh, the local hot spots on uh, Enceladus. These would be good places to look for any sort of possible plume activity, uh, because we know from Enceladus already that uh, these hot regions can correspond to very vigorous plumes. Uh, and then also an ultraviolet uh, spectrometer, which will be able to study any water both on the surface in the form of ice or in the term of form of water being ejected out into space and understand uh, its exact uh, composition. Now, what about the space whale hydrophone? Yeah, so there's one more instrument. So that's Long eight of the nine instruments. Uh, and the last instrument is, depending on who you ask, uh, either the most important instrument or the instrument that's going to drag down this mission. Uh, and that's the radar. And this is as close as we're going to get right now to having the ability to drill down through the surface. And the idea is this is what we call an active sensing instrument because you blast radar waves from the spacecraft into the surface of Europa, and then you measure what reflects back. And the argument for having this instrument is that if you can penetrate down into the ice shell and find the water underneath, you can measure exactly how far from the surface the ocean is. And that's a key piece of information if you ever plan to go and drill into that in the future. Right, and potentially, you know, we've seen with the cracks on the surface, of, you know, all of that's going on, that potentially there could be spots that are, that are thinner, that you, you don't have to dig down 100 kilometers if you can find that, that spot. And I, you can kind of imagine, just as they've done with the Mars missions, in the future you're going to have the situation where they're going to suggest potential landing sites, but in this case, because potentially there's interesting structures underneath the ice that they may want to try and investigate. Right, and so the radar will help us understand both the composition of the surface kind of underneath that very first layer, but also hopefully the ocean underneath. Uh, but there's a major drawback to having a radar, which is they are the most power and data intensive instruments basically in science. Uh, there's a good chance that the radar will consume more power and need to transmit more data back to Earth than all of the other scientific instruments combined. Uh, and some people say that if the ocean is actually further below the surface than maybe we previously thought, that you're going to be carrying this huge, expensive, powerful instrument that doesn't contribute a lot to, um, to the uh, understanding of Europa. And so uh, Bradley talked earlier sort of about holy worlds in science. And in planetary science right now, the holy war of choice is whether or not a radar is an appropriate instrument uh, for use on this Europa mission. Well, there's only going. one way to find out. And the that's war the has been resolved. It's going, uh, and we'll launch alongside the other instruments, hopefully in the early 2020s, uh, but could be uh, in the latter 2020s, NASA has just said, uh, in the coming decade. So, in other words, if the ice is too thick, if the ice is beyond the 
the depth that the radar can can penetrate, then it's just going to be, nope, the whole thing's ice. Or as far as we can see, it's still ice. I really wish we hadn't included a radar. Right, so you'll be able to put at minimum a uh, lower limit on how deep the ice must be. Um, because you say, well, we can't look through it, and we know we can look this far in. It must be deeper than that. Uh, but the scientists working uh, towards radar observations in Europa also claim that you're going to be able to understand a lot about the morphology and the geology of the surface and subsurface of Europa, even if you don't get to the ocean. Uh, we use ground penetrating right? radar here on Earth to understand the interior of planet Earth. People have suggested using radar on the moon to understand the interior of the moon. Uh, and so it's not going to be a total waste, but it's a major investment, and it's a big gamble that the ocean is where we think it is. Right, and one of the other possibilities, though, is it's not just like a crust of ice, water underneath, that there could be pockets of water, ways that water is moving around within the ice structure through cracks and fissures. And, and right. uh, no, and I think the only way to do it is to find out, to take the brave step of adding a radar to the yeah. mission. If that kind of stuff is there, the radar is the only instrument that can find it. And that's the argument that I think ultimately sold it uh, to the upper levels of NASA management. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's terrific. Uh, so, you know, is that the kind of arguments, the kinds of religious wars that you have to sort of sit in, uh, Bradley? Uh, yeah, some, sometimes, but I think that in the end, uh, you know, you do look at something like this and realize that the one thing that we really have to know is, is the, the ice sheet thin enough to penetrate? And the radar is the only way to know that, and even if you get a, you know, if you get a null result that you can't find the, the, the bottom of the ice, you've learned something really important. You're not going to invest a, a lot of money in something that's, that to try to drill through it because you've realized you simply can't. So despite the fact that this is a, a risk item, this is one of those that you, uh, this, is, this is a risk you want to take. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to not having a reset button, for example, on your, on your <laughs> spacecraft. Yes, right, yes. Right. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, uh, Charles, um, did you want to talk about the end of Rosetta? And we don't have a lot of yeah. time, so just give oh, us like the, the okay. one-minute version. One minute version is Rosetta entered orbit around comet 67P Turin Umov Gerasimenko last August. Uh, it released a washing machine sized uh, lander called Filet that uh, bounced a couple of times uh, but eventually landed and did some science when it landed on the comet. Uh, the news about Rosetta at the moment is that they're trying to wake up Filet again. Um, hoping that it's sort of getting its batteries charged up. It's the fourth time that they've tried to uh, re-establish communications, so they're still trying to do that. Uh, the other news about Rosetta this week is a proposal uh, by the lead scientist Matt Taylor that when the mission comes to an end, it's meant to end at the end of December 2015, um, they're trying to get it extended slightly, that rather than just essentially putting the space probe into orbit into hibernation, but to actually try and land Rosetta uh, on the surface of the comet. So it would be sort of landing Mark II. And the argument is that they'll do a lot more science uh, by doing that than basically letting it sort of just uh, go into a sleepy orbit uh, uh, until it runs out of fuel. So uh, the proposal has got to be approved by European Space Agency uh, councils and committees still, um, but obviously it'll be quite exciting if we can have another probe uh, ending its life in that way. Yeah, well this isn't the first time that that mission controllers have decided to take a spacecraft that maybe was never intended to land on a space, on a on an object and, and do so. Uh, the one was uh, was it uh, to asteroid near to asteroid Eros? Right. They uh, at the end of the mission, they they soft landed it on the asteroid yeah. and uh, and got a little bit of last science before it smashed yeah. into the surface of the of the asteroid. So, I'm all for that. Uh, although, you know, maybe ten years down the road, when when the comet comes back into a place mm -hmm. where the where the solar panels can fill up with energy again, they'll be glad they kept it around. I, that would be a tough one for me to to choose. So. I do yeah, like. But we'll have little cubesats that can go and do it by then, with yeah, sort of yeah, redundancy we'll, built in. Yeah, exactly. We'll we'll zip there in our EM drive and uh, and look around on the surface. So yeah, it'll be a different story then. Um, okay, cool. So I think we got one last and quick one from 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 you, Brian, which is uh, the discovery of a of another Kuiper belt around another 
solar system. Yeah, this is interesting. This is from the uh, uh, Gemini South Telescope in Chile, and it is uh, direct imaging of a Kuiper belt around another star. So in our solar system, the Kuiper belt is basically an icy outer asteroid belt, if you want to call it that. It's the uh, bodies beyond Neptune, basically, that are a disk, but not as far out as the Oort cloud and not in a halo. And uh, this particular star is about 50% more massive than the sun. It's about 10 to 20 million years old, and you can image it. Um, I don't know if anyone can bring up the picture. I don't think I can, but uh, you can definitely see a ring around this star. It's in the right range. It has the right brightness to be consistent with what we know of the Kuiper belt, and we're now imaging around other stars, which is kind of cool. That is awesome. Uh, it's got to be an insanely big Kuiper belt, right? compared to ours, to be able to view it from this far away? No, it's about, it's about the same size. It's uh, between uh, about 35 to 55 AU from, this, from the star, which is you know roughly where our Kuiper belt is. Uh, I got a couple of questions from the viewers here. Uh, one, it looks like we finally worked through all our technical issues. Thanks for reloading your screens, everybody. Um, uh, Patrick Festa asks, uh, with the radar, could it be used conservatively to save power? I'm sh Morgan, do they think they'll save power on it? Uh, I mean, certainly they could choose to image, you know, with the radar less frequently. I don't know if you can really, you know, transmit less power in order and still get a, a useful result back, but they could be selective about where they choose. Uh, and if they saw, for example, a hot spot using the, the infrared camera, that might be an ideal place to think that the crust is thinner and you could focus on uh, taking radar observations of that region. Cool. Um, great. Well, and now we've got all the uh, technology solved. So I'm going to uh, sort of start to wrap this up because we're sort of nearing the the end of the time, and I know Dr. Pearson's got to move quickly. So, but but before we let you go, can you let us know where we can find out more? Where can we find out more information about both sort of your research? Uh, how can I, how can we all take your class uh, at Ohio State University? And um, and where can we sort of see you know what uh, I guess. I guess, what your committee is working on. Uh, if you want to know what's, what's happening with the committees and the science in particular, just go to uh, science.nasa.gov and you can navigate from there. Uh, you, can find, you, you can find me on there under advisory committees or science committee and uh, any other member of the science committee as well and you can go right to their web pages. Fantastic. And, and if we want to take your course, what uh, What's coming up next? Well, what's coming up next is uh, I, I'm 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 probably going to be retiring from the faculty, so I'm not oh, going to no. be I'm not going to be teaching another course anytime really soon. But we uh, we are developing an online course, uh, Astronomy 1101, from planets to the cosmos, uh, and uh, uh, we expect that that will be uh, available online probably within a year. We're going to be doing a version that's just on campus for the uh, for next year. Yeah, and you wrote a textbook too, right? I've written a couple textbooks. I wrote one on Active Galaxies, a beginning level textbook for graduate students, and uh, another one on Foundations of Astrophysics with uh, Barbara Ryden. That's that's basically intended for second year uh, college students. Oh, I used that book when I was an undergrad. Well, did you? Well, I <laughs> yeah, hope you enjoyed like it. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, Dr. Koberlein, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me on my website, which is briancoverline.com, or Twitter at Brian Coverline. Uh, I've got a daily blog. I've got a podcast. Uh, if you want to support it, you can go to Patreon and support it and watch everyone giggle every time I have to hawk it now. Uh, That's <laughs> so, good. So I'm pretty easy to find. You're just getting known to it. It's awesome. Um, uh, and, yeah. and, and how do we take your class next? Uh, I actually don't know what I'm teaching in the fall. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I just finished up spring term, and Clearly, I'll find out this, sometime in July. This was the wrong question to ask people uh, this week. Uh, Charles, uh, how do we take your class, and uh, where do we find out more? Well, to take our class, just simply go to send.com, and we have lots of brilliant people like provisional Dr. Morgan Renberg uh, and Mr. Dickinson and lots of other great writers who all know what they're talking about. So do come and join send.com. Uh, and become a member, and you might even end up with a beautiful blue uh, Sen hoodie 
like I'm modeling for you as a special offer to weekly Space Hangout crew only. So if you do anything this evening or after this Hangout, come and check out send.com. Fantastic. Morgan, where do we find out more? Well, you can find me right after this over at the Google Plus Space community. I'll take uh, the questions we probably didn't get a chance to answer. Uh, you can check out my latest Cassini update over at send.com. Uh, Cassini was doing some stuff other than science this week. Uh, and as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or visit morganrenberg.com. So fantastic. And so I just want to uh, make another mention. So congratulations to Matt Woods on the WSH crew. He was voted to the management committee of the Perth Observatory Volunteer Group, and he's now their news and media coordinator. Couldn't happen to a better person. So congrats, Matt. Uh, and now there's 400 members in the WSH crew, and so this is the this is the Google Plus community that is uh, that really is the producers of this show. They were the ones that organized Dr. Peterson to come on this show. Uh, so. So a big thank you to the folks of the WSH crew. We literally could not do this without your help. And so if you want to join a really dedicated group of community, check out the WSH crew on, on Google+. Now 400 strong. Um, of course, it's Fraser King, Universe Today. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, we make videos. It's, it's great. So, uh, uh, so once again, thank you so much, Dr. Peterson, for joining us. Sorry about the video problems. I blame Google um, okay. because they were having their... They're, they're having their big Google I.O. right now, and nobody was handling technical support. So, oh, okay. um, But we oh, really appreciate you joining us. And uh, maybe when you've got another big announcement, another big a big sort of update to the science goals, we'd love to come back and talk to you. You know, I'd love to even do a whole show just talking about sort of the next round of, of science goals with what NASA is doing. So. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I enjoyed yeah. this. That's, That's great. great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right, well, so thank you, everybody, for, for watching. Apologize for the problems, and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye-bye.